Roll. Mrs. Kramer? Here. Mrs. Lane? Here. Mrs. Rich? Here. Mrs. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Kraftcheck? Here. Mr. Parzik? Here. The meeting is now open. Adequate notice of the meeting was provided by posting a copy of the time and place on the municipal clerk's bulletin board and mailing a copy of same to the press in the Cape May County Herald on January 4th, 2017. Will everyone please rise to salute the flag? We are going to start today's work session with natural resources. Josie? Yes, and I'm going to pass it to Dr. Lenore Tedesco to give us an update of natural resources. Pretty much summer and fall and everything. Summer's over? What happened? I don't know. <laughs> Long gone now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still in shock over that. Uh, a couple of quick points for you. Uh, start with Stone Harbor Point. Give you a couple updates on the point. Um, as you all know, the uh, point is now open to fishing vehicles with appropriate uh, permits from the borough following uh, Labor Day. Um, to, in order to help facilitate that, uh, the New, New Jersey Endangered Non-Game Species Program, uh, they manage the fencing that's out there. They move the fencing back to create um, driving access, and they also, at that point in time, replace the signage from uh, area closure for beach nesting birds to area closed for migratory shorebirds. Uh, late at the end of November, they will shift the area uh, back again uh, once the migratory birds are out. And at that time, they will change the signage to just simply say no vehicles behind beyond this point. And what they're trying to do at that point is keep vehicles from driving over some of the habitat areas and causing damage. Uh, last year, we had a little bit of uh, confusion messaging with the public and they did that because um, it didn't really say stay out of the dunes. Uh, we usually don't have stay out of the dune signs down there because the area is usually closed, so people don't get to the dunes. Um, so this year, um, the Public Works will be adding a few signs in key places in the dunes to post them uh, the standard way that the rest of the dunes in the borough are posted just to keep people from walking through the dunes. Um, those will be temporary signs that will then be removed again uh, prior to uh, March 15th when the area will again be closed further away from that point. So, um, so that's in process. <clears throat> the uh, resiliency dune that's uh, out there was uh, managed for some Phragmites that started working up onto the dune. That uh, spraying was done by uh, the Endangered Non-Game Species Program in partnership with uh, stewardship out of the New Jersey Audubon Society, and that was done on, uh, March on March, September 13th, um, and that was completed. Uh, the beach stewards program uh, that we had out on the um, point that was uh, covered this year by the borough. It's in its third year. The first two years were covered by the grant program. The uh, program's goal was to reduce disturbance to beach nesting birds and migratory shorebirds, document disturbance, and also provide educational information and in, uh, about the resources down there for the public. The stewards uh, were present from uh, basically <coughs> Memorial Day to Labor Day. They uh, logged more than 500 hours out there. They were there seven days a week. And uh, for the time period between June 27th and August 22nd, they provided escorts to the police. Uh, and that was a time period when there were uh, unfledged chicks. So chicks that were out there that couldn't fly during that time frame, there's a restriction on any vehicle driving out there. So this was the program that, um, that Josie helped negotiate back a couple years ago to enable the police to use uh, the open ATVs, but they still needed a monitor to, to escort them. So that was an important um, ability to allow the police to be able to get down there. So the stewards performed that task through that time frame. In total, they engaged uh, 318 visitors. They recorded 118 incidents. Um, of the 118, they were able to communicate with the person, the beachgoer, 67 times. The other times that they were unable to, it was because they, people were either in an area they couldn't access or they were so far down the beach, they, never, they couldn't get to them at that time. Um, all interactions with the beachgoers resulted in a behavior change that, uh, better, that resulted in a better outcome for the birds. Um, of the incidents, um, there were, and I can, uh, the, the, the final report will be ready soon that we'll distribute. Of them, the most incidents were uh, entering the fencing. There were 26 that entered the, offense, the fencing area and six that approached it. 
uh, dogs on the beach were 19, landing watercraft were 21, low flying aircraft was 17, kite flying was nine and entering the water was another eight. So it was all really kind of almost all of them were in those, in those areas. Uh, the low flying aircraft is getting to be an interesting component. Um, not much that we could do about that. However, the um, state and the federal government is uh, looking at new uh, information that's going out to uh, low flying aircraft because they are creating disturbances. There was uh, a memo sent to the key um, companies that are flying the advertising planes over the beaches and they were notified of new rules and regulations to fix disturbance this year. So that was a brand new thing that's not happened uh, before and it's, it's really related to, um, to the red knots uh, being captured in uh, federal protection for the first time. So there's gonna be some additional activity related to low flying aircraft going forward. And uh, so we were actually asked specifically to document those uh, disturbance, what kind of disturbance there is related to those. And in fact, there were disturbances. In most cases, uh, the birds lifted off of nests when the aircraft were flying low. Some of it's also military, and that'll be another interesting thing. The federal government will manage communication with the military when the Coast Guard fly really low over the point. It's kind of <laughs> like we're spending all our effort and time and they, they buzz the point. Um, in comparison uh, between 2015, 16, and 17, we have some interesting graph there. Prior to compare to prior years, we're continuing to see a decrease in the number of landed watercraft and the number of people entering fencing. So that is going down. Um, the dog incidence is, um, however, increased from last, from last year, uh, but they were lower than the first year. But this may be related to a shift in when we had stewards on the beach, which was intentional. We moved stewards to the beach in the early morning hours and later afternoon hours, which is the time when if people are gonna walk their dogs, that's when they go. So it was an intentional shift then to try to manage uh, dogs on the beach because they were getting to the beach a little later on and they were clearly dog tracked on the beach. So, so some of that change may actually be us actually capturing it, not so much an increase in that, in that use. Um, and as I said, uh, there's a final report being prepared that includes a lot of information about the time of day and day of weeks when we saw the most, uh, most interactions, had the most interactions with people and uh, we'll continue to adjust steward scheduling to try to, to try to better manage that. And I'll have that report to you in the next couple of weeks. Uh, last thing related to uh, beach is uh, beach sweep is scheduled for the 21st. Uh, and that's being managed uh, in cooperation with the POA, the borough and the wetlands. And uh, that'll be at 95th Street is where everyone's gathering at nine o'clock uh, from nine to noon and public works is providing uh, some support to that. And that's also uh, coordinated with, with clean ocean action. So that's a statewide uh, beach sweep on that day. Sanctuary, a couple things going on there. Um, two uh, notable ones, the BRIC program, Memorial BRIC program that has been out there um, is being ended now due to several uh, challenges and difficulties that we've had administering that program. Uh, the company that was doing the BRIC engraving um, is no longer doing the engraving, which uh, led to a fairly extensive search to find someone else to do the engraving. We thought we had that worked out. Uh, the Sanctuary Committee worked on that um, adjusted the program, got all set, got some new bricks in to get them engraved, and they came back and they were terrible. They were just not right. They don't look the same. They're pretty distinctly different. And uh, so we're in a, a mode now where we're trying to get that group of them at least fixed. And uh, it's just taken so much time and effort to get some of these bricks out there. And we don't really have a good solution of having any kind of bricks that even look anything close to the ones that are out there. So for all those reasons, the recommendation from the committee to the uh, from the Bird Sanctuary Committee to the Natural Resources Committee is to just put a staple in it and, and move on. And I believe that was, uh, that recommendation was in fact adopted by, by the committee. Uh, the Heron Cam that's been out there, this is another area. Um, the Bird Sanctuary Committee reviewed the Heron Cam usage statistics out there and uh, it's just uh, not getting a lot of usage. It's kind of a difficult camera because uh, most of the cameras that work really well and have a lot of high traffic usage are actually directly on a nest where there's activity. And this was kind of just an overview of, of the wooded area. Um, the costs for Comcast and Atlantic City Electric out there are, are very high and the usage just didn't seem to support continuation. Um, the equipment was initially funded by a private citizen um, and with the, with the utility costs fr coming from the Bird Sanctuary Reserve uh, account. Um, so those are, were not direct uh, borough 
funds supporting that, but the uh, Bird Sanctuary Committee is not interested in continuing to put so much uh, resources into maintaining that. So the uh, private citizen was notified we we're going to not continue to do that, and uh, we've started to make moves to remove the camera from the website and hopefully uh, we'll cut off the, the funds flow to that area so we can retain that money. And uh, I'm working right now with the, um, with the website to kind of just adjust to where that is. So that was something that we've decided to stop. Holly Path reopened for the season on October 1st. Um, the, there was a round of invasive plant management out at the sanctuary uh, this summer with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service managing some Japanese knotweed that was done uh, in quite a bit of coordination by a lot of folks. We had uh, a volunteer from the committees out uh, brambling through and cutting trackways out there and getting it started. U.S. Fish and Wildlife came in and did the treatment but also trained Public Works on how to do that because that's something they're not going to be able to continue to support. Um, and going forward, Public, uh, Public Works will manage this in the future to keep to stay on that. Um, so Public Works did a great job. Thanks to Rocky and, and some of his guys were out. We're working right now to schedule uh, Clean Shores uh, Department of Corrections team to come out and help continue to manage some of the vines out there. Uh, we're looking at uh, November 6th to 10th as a date um, to have them out to continue that work. We're also working to replace some uh, trail signage out there that's uh, some of the signage there is just it's time to replace it. It's faded and cracked and just not looking very good. Um, the sanctuary committee has a three year schedule for signage replacement out there. Some of it to be finished uh, still yet this year. The three trail signs will be done this year. Next year there'll be another round of some of the big informational signs, those big uh, double stand up signs that are at the um, turnout area and then over on second will be replaced. And then uh, in 2019, there's plans to do a, a few educational signs. Overall, there's a dramatic decrease in signage out there. We removed something like 28 signs out there, and ultimately we'll only be, the ones that are still out there now are in a replacement cycle, so we're not, we're just trying to back that way back. It was just a lot. Uh, Docent-led tours um, this summer were uh, led by naturalists from the Wetlands Institute. They went through from June 4th through August 27th. There were Sundays in June and Saturdays and Sundays in July and August. Uh, in 2017, we had 264 people participate in that, and that's up from 196 in 2016. We plan on continuing with that approach. Um, last couple of things, the Dune Vegetation Management Plan. Um, Lomax Consulting provided the results of a survey they did. Um, on the location and size of Jack Japanese black pines in the boroughs, specifically in the dunes, to be used for dune management uh, prioritization for any projects in there. So they documented um, really the public lands along the Atlantic and included Stone Harbor Point, and they really focused only on mature trees, those that are capable of producing seeds and reproducing, and they just and they provided some maps of kind of high concentration, medium, low, with high being more than 10 mature trees, medium about five to 10, and low was less than that. Um, in that survey, they identified the area between 80th and 83rd Street as an area of high priority because um, the area between 82nd and 83rd had a high concentration, and the other two areas had a medium concentration, um, whereas there were only five other places of one block each that had only medium concentration. So that's really the a focal point for the borough where there's a high concentration of the Japanese back black pines. Natural Resources has asked uh, for a proposal from, uh, from Lomax on how to manage that area, similar to uh, just following the steps and process. Um, that'll be reviewed and then shared with interested landowners in the area to see if anyone wants to participate in a management plan for that specific area for Japanese black pines. And last, uh, but certainly not least, one of my highlights, um, the meadow area that was, uh, that's at 118th and uh, Dune was absolutely a huge success. If you hadn't had a chance to drive by there and see what was going on out there, it was pretty spectacular. To remind you, volunteers planted about 1,100 plants there in May, and uh, most of them flowered this year. So by kind of late uh, July, August, it was pretty spectacular out there. Um, it was heavily utilized by pollinators, butterflies, and birds of all types. Uh, it's an official monarch uh, watch area, counting station and banding station. And uh, there were three different times that monarchs were tagged out there. I was out there for a couple of those. Um, I started taking pictures and trying to document the butterflies that are out there. I'm pretty good with my butterfly ID, and there were several butterflies. I had no idea what they were. <laughs> you kind of know it's working when you build it, they come, and you don't know who the heck they are. 
Um, so I'm working on those lists. Uh, one of the identifications is uh, unusual enough that it needs to be confirmed because the butterfly is north of its range. It's a, a purple hair streak, a great purple hair streak. I've never seen one before. It's pretty cool. I don't know what else it could be. Um, I was out there at the end of September. We had a really good monarch push this year. You might have seen um, that. I was out there for a 30 minute period and counted 109 monarchs coming in to that spot. So it was kind of pretty neat. Um, I was also struck by the times I have been out there, the public comments of people going by it was pretty spectacular. Two guys uh, on a bike with a carrying a surfboard went whipping by me and said, hey, there's monarchs in there. And I was like, <laughs> you know, just really cool um, people asking me if it's a monarch garden, telling me there's milkweed out there. I had uh, a woman come up to me uh, asking if she could bring her monarch caterpillars there because she planted milkweed in her yard and they had stripped them off and she was really worried about them. So I said yes and she went running home and came back 20 minutes later with <laughs> a container full of caterpillars to add there. So it, it's been a really neat site. Um, it's important. It's a uh, it's significant spot. It's definitely helped with the, with the stop over there. Um, the, mi the migration is still happening. It's getting late. There was some moving today, um, but it was a pretty cool spot. So congratulations to all of you for having the wisdom and foresight to create a pretty <laughs> special spot. Uh, winter management is going to be to leave it kind of the way it is. It's kind of what we're calling it a meadow and messaging about that. It isn't the garden. Uh, the seed source is right now are really important. There's a ton of birds in there. If you go in there, birds will fly out all over the place. They're feeding on those seeds. Uh, we'll wait till early spring and do some cleanup. There's also probably a... Um, a fairly high number of, uh, there's several butterfly that overwinter in the pupa phase and they're down in the leaf litter. So if you clean that out, you're kind of ruining the, the point of what you were doing out there. So really neat stuff. That's kind of my report. Um, of course, I saved what I think is the best for last. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone. I have has one, any. Lenore. Sure. On beach access, uh, you talked about the low flying aircraft. Yep. Do you have any problems with the red knots with drones at all? Drones are a very big problem. Indeed. How do you control them? Well, I, I don't control them, but there, I, most uh, communities are starting to have uh, specific ordinances against drones. Some communities have them captured under other low-flying um, aspects and they're included, but um, drones are a big problem. Mm -hmm. If you Google birds and drones, you'll get nonstop videos about uh, birds attacking drones. They view them as a threat. They're a lot of the predators <coughs> Uh, for uh, beach nesting birds, migratory shorebirds are in fact things like peregrine falcons <laughs> and bald eagles and they come in from above. So that's, that's part of the reason the kites are a problem in the red uh, overheads. Would you like to see this council move forward with some kind of an ordinance against those? For uh, drones, I think, I, absolutely. In, in, in lieu, uh, you know, to help the habitat? Mm -hmm. I think it's appropriate. All right, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Anything else? Good. The um, project that you and I had talked about or yes. the partnership you and I talked about last year. Yep, we're ready for that meeting. Okay, so just can, why don't you just give an overview so everybody knows what it is that we talked sure. about. Lenore had approached me about this last year, but we were a little too late in getting it off the ground. So if you'll just tell everybody what's sure. up. So there's a, a project that we're working on um, right now, and there's also several other uh, initiatives. It's related to trying to find um, missing and lost uh, recreational uh, crab traps. Uh, these are unintentionally lost traps, whether the buoys broke or a storm got them, or for whatever reason, they are not retrieved after they are put it out in the waters. The, um, they're called ghost traps because they continue to fish. So one, uh, while this trap is out there, they initially have bait in them. Animals go in for that bait. Nobody ever retrieves it. The animals die in there. So they become effectively the next set of bait and the next round of bait. So they're actually quite detrimental overall, aside from bycatch of fish and other crabs. Diamondback terrapins drown in them because they breathe air. So um, we actually have fairly good evidence to suggest that the loss um, to <coughs> Uh, to diamondback terrapins drowning in crab pots may in fact be larger than roadkill that we see here. So it's, it's a dramatic uh, thing. The number of tra crab pots that are out there is absolutely astronomical. Uh, so we've been working uh, actually with some funding from the Disney Conservation Fund to find these traps. The challenge is that um, they can't be deemed to be a ghost trap or a lost trap until the season is closed. So uh, crabbers have three days after the season closed to remove them, and once that, if they're still out there at that point in time, then we can remove them. This is all permitted through uh, uh, 
conservation officers with uh, New Jersey uh, Game and Fish. Um, that time frame, of course, is December 15th through March 14th, which means you've got to be out on the water in the middle of the winter in pretty cold, uncomfortable times. We use side scan sonars and also just uh, visual sightings at super low tide to see them and find where they are. Um, some of them still have buoys on them. Those are obviously the easy ones. Um, so we work to bring them in every year, and what we're trying to do is expand that program and engage with um, the commercial and recreational fishermen that are here, that have boats, that can work with us to help find them and remove them. Uh, we're actually working on a grant proposal um, right now on two separate proposals to try to increase the size of that program as well. So we um, approached um, the mayor asking um, if she had access to any contacts within that fishing community where we can just set up a meeting, educate them on, on what's happening, and see if we could find other help, because it's really, you know, a couple of our staff out in the middle of the winter in a one boat trying to pull traps. Um, and it's dramatic. Some of these traps, you'll pull them, and there's, you know, 20, 30 carcasses of, of trout in here. Aside from all the other things that are in there, there's just no reason to, to leave them out there. They're also just a hazard. Um, they're, it's, it's marine debris, and they're, uh, they're navigational hazards, and they're just bycatch hazards. So one of the things we were thinking is we could just have some kind of a, uh, just start to do a push education-wise and maybe have a community meeting, maybe at the, at the Wetlands Institute or at the uh, rec building, and invite boaters, invite the public, anybody who can help in any way and kind of get the word out that it's, that this is out there and happening and anybody who can help can help and it's just a way of starting to educate people about these ghost traps and especially it's, it's remarkable that there's so many losses, everybody looking on the roadway and is yeah. looking at those losses like, oh my God, meanwhile, there is even more taking place and I don't know how many people are out on boats after mm -hmm. December 15th, but there are some, for sure. There are some, yeah, you know, just so we sure. can get some yeah. kind of a, just a little community awareness and maybe a partnership with people would well, be a good idea. So I was thinking we just set up something maybe in about a month from now where we will be meeting to get specifics where we could maybe do an evening and a Saturday morning so we can appeal to as many people as possible and have them come out and yeah, see if there's some great. way that we can all work together. Yep, it's a, it is an awareness thing for sure. To give you an example, uh, Barnegat Bay, a uh, couple of folks working at, in Barnegat Bay in the last year they alone, they pulled more than a thousand wow. traps out of Barnegat Bay. So they're just out there, right? If you lose a few a year and a lot a year, you get a big storm, so and they just sit there. So yeah, that would be great. It was on my list uh, today to follow up. So appreciate good, it. Good, good. Any other questions? Great, Great job. Thank you. Um, I'd just yeah. like to add to that um, at our at both at the <coughs> bird sanctuary meeting when we were talking about the bird sanctuary and then again at natural resource meeting we did um, come up with a plan to please uh, repaint the mural that goes around the pump station at uh, at the bird sanctuary and we did find the original artist who did it years and years ago <clears throat> and we also did get a quote and i would just like to have that approved tonight and it's a thousand dollars to have her come back and repaint the mural around the bird sanctuary so that's all I'm asking for tonight is a thousand dollars. Thank you. Do you have anything? Um, just uh, two two other things. Um, under the beach replenishment, um, I have reached out to Army Corps to see when they will be coming back to do the dune plantings, which is the last element. I have not heard back from them yet, but it should be relatively soon, I would think. <coughs> Um, flood mitigation, Stockton um, has actually finished doing the actual surveys of the bulkhead heights, um, so I should have a final report from them very shortly. Once I do receive that, um, I will be scheduling a meeting with the ad hoc committee to discuss that and continue with our discussions on the flood, mit flood, flood mitigation. That's it. Budget now or not? I'm sorry, what? Are we doing budgets during or later? Um, yeah, you might as well do budget now. Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a small one. It's usually on the box, so on the bottom, because we can look backwards, right? Yeah, mine's probably on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> Too bad. Because we reversed tonight. Natural Resources had the got put on first base tonight. Okay, um, for natural resources, um, 
the recommendation last year's budget was 61,000. Um, this year we're requesting to increase to $77,365 and the primary increase in that is under professional fees. And under that we have our um, annual fee for monitoring the bird sanctuary of 25,000. Um, additional fees to do the survey for the back bays, uh, which is a um, biannual program that we'll be doing moving forward. That's 7,000. I've also put 7,000 in for dune beach management. Uh, the stewardship program for 14,000, and then an additional 10,000 for flood mitigation consultation. So that's pretty much it. Everything else is. Um, the same as last year under Bird Sanctuary. We've got the, the maintenance. We have the portable toilet rental uh, herbicide for invasive management uh, website updates and the signage for the sanctuary. That's it. Does anybody have any questions on any specific line items? Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Is that it for natural resources? That's it. Okay. So sweet. Moving on, public safety, Mr. Parzik. <coughs> uh, we have the usual list of suspects, so we'll start with uh, Mrs. Scott, the court administrator. And, and I, <coughs> uh, just as, as a way of starting, we're going to go through the same type of O&E budget that Jill just went through for natural resources for each of these public safety departments. And I, I just want to say the only, uh, the only increase of any note is the fire, the volunteer fire company stipends and the EMS stipends, changes that we've already discussed uh, before in how we're doing business there. Other than that, all of the budgets and public safety essentially are the same as last year. So with that, Mrs. Scott. Good afternoon. I just want to let everybody on council know that Stone Harbor's Municipal Court is going to be hosting uh, our Vicinage Quarterly Meeting on December 8th. That is when all the judges, administrators, directors, deputies get together for a meeting to learn what is going on throughout the state with rules and regulations concerning us. And it will be here. It's like 75 to 80 people that will be in the building at that point. So if anybody wants to stop by to see anybody, they're welcome and to. And when is that? <laughs> it's December 8th. It's a Friday. And it will be from 9.30 to 12.30 that the facilities will be used. And we put out coffee. Dana Have we ever hosted it before? Is this the first time we've had it? I, as, since I've been administrator, we have not hosted one. It goes around Atlantic and Cape May County and they've asked us to sponsor it this time. So, okay. And I figure since we haven't done it in quite some time. <laughs> All right, okay. And then on to my budget. I'm holding it, it's been 16,000 for the past couple of years and I wanna continue to hold it at the 16,000. At this point, there are really no line items that I'm concerned about because if I don't have money in one, it comes from another one, so. I, at this point, I'm at like 12,000 in spending for the year. So the 4,000 I'd like to keep in there as a cushion because we never know when tickets have to be changed, when I need to have interpreters that cost a little bit more than my Spanish interpreter because <laughs> every once in a while I have to have sign language or an Asian one. So does anybody have any questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. Great job. <coughs> Chief Stanford. I'm in the hot seat, the only uh, increase, huh? That's <laughs> <laughs> we'll start uh, with the report for September. Uh, during the month, we had 26 calls, and uh, that was uh, substantially more than we had last year in September. Everybody keeping track. We had 47 EMS calls. The um, during the month, the most of uh, notable calls. We had two building fires. One was obviously the 87th Street fire. 
We also had a small building fire on 81st Street. Uh, we did have two surf rescues, motor vehicle accidents, uh, all your, your basic calls for the month. Uh, as we said in the budgets, and I'm going to go over it. I'll, I'll come back to the fire budget. The uniform fire code budget is exactly the same as last year. We've basically dialed it in. We, we uh, mostly off of supplies. It's a small budget of $8,000. Um, so that's a 0% increase for that. Uh, I, I did the budget for JT for the emergency management budget. That's also a 0% increase. That's also a small budget. Um, years past, we had more money in there um, in anticipation of storms. Now we just have a, a flat amount. We figure if there's a storm, we always can find the money somewhere to take care of that instead of carrying it over every year. Uh, the aid to the rescue squad is the same as it has been at $70,000. Um, the fire budget, uh, as we've stated is, and we've discussed here numerous times, is um, we are to increasing the stipends for the fire department and the EMS providers. Um, we are attempting to uh, resolve some of our manpower issues at night by putting uh, between two and four uh, firefighters in the firehouse for a 12 hour shift. We've also increased the amount that the EMS will providers will receive for their daily stipends. So the final budget figure is $383,500. I did meet with the ANF committee on Tuesday, Monday? Monday. 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 And we, uh, we talked about the, the stipend program. Um, so I've hit everybody on council except for Councilwoman Kramer, and I spoke to her today, and if she has any questions, I'm more than happy to sit down with her and explain all the uh, ins and outs of the manpower issues and the stipend problems. Um, so I think we're in good shape. Anybody have any questions? Could, could you just, just very brief, briefly, Roger, to the, to the people uh, in the audience, explain why we did what we did? In other words, the, the nighttime coverage we felt was lacking. We've, well, uh, basically, we've been, we've been experiencing for a number of years, and actually at our ANF, ANF meeting, we'd, uh, we've been discussing this since uh, Tom Cope was uh, Public Safety Committee Chairman. So it's been a number of years about manpower issues, specifically our nighttime manpower issues. We do not have firefighters that live in Stone Harbor. Uh, at the present time, we have 11, um, but only six of them are able to actually fight fires with what we call SCBA certified, which means they can put an air pack on and go in the fire. Um, most of the others that are, are older, nothing wrong with being older, but they're just not able to, uh, to fight the fires. Um, so we keep losing people. Uh, what precipitated this was we lost one of our, our big firefighters who was here at every call, who moved offshore, and we're getting ready to lose another one of our firefighters, so that will bring us down to four, five available firefighters, um, which would be great, like I said in our meeting, if we knew they were gonna be here every single day and never take vacations or anything like that. So we adopted a, a, or adopting a program similar to Avalon who is having these same problems we are. Um, we may have seen a lot of it that was in the news last year when they adopted these same program because they don't have the nighttime coverage. So we're actually gonna have firemen that are in the firehouse for, uh, for 12 hours at night that will be available to respond on the fire truck instantly to, to, to the fire call. Um, so that's why we budgeted. And we budgeted, for the first year, we budgeted for the maximum of four firefighters per night for the year. So that's why it's $150,000. Um, we talked in ANF that we, after the first year, we may say we don't need 150, we could back it down because I personally don't believe we're gonna have 100% coverage for the year with four firefighters. So we can, we can see how it works. Um, I'd love to say that we could have four firefighters there for, for every, every night, that would be great, but I just don't think that's feasible. We did have 17 members at the meeting we had with public safety that said they were interested, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. I, I, it's a very positive program, and everybody's excited about it uh, at the firehouse, so we'll, I think it'll, it'll, it'll work well for us. Um, EMS, we talked about EMS has not, the, the stipends had not been raised in 17 years. So we adopted that new program at the last month's meeting where we reduced the number of EMTs from three to two, and then we also providing, we changed the, the criteria for the stipend. So the new stipend, they'll be getting $145 per shift, um, which still, uh, as I said, our meeting, we can't talk about hourly, but it brings them to like $12 an hour for, for the EMS for service. So again, that was very well received. Um, it does require less EMTs because we, we reduced 30 shifts a month by going to two EMTs. Uh, we've had 
great response with that. So I think both programs uh, will work. Um, we don't know how long they'll work. That's always the, the given, but we, we, uh, we think this is a good, good step to try to make this work. And again, it's working in Avalon, but we just, we just are bringing it down here. There were some questions that we've uh, raised at the a &F with Jim Kraft, and uh, I think Jim and I resolved them, so I think we're on good, good, good shape to move, move forward. Good plan. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Frankie. Chief Shutter. Good afternoon. Uh, like Mr. Parchi said, the budget for uh, 2018, we kept it flat. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. Uh, the report for September. Uh, for the police department, there were 159 motor vehicle stops. Uh, seven adults were arrested for various things. Uh, the following officers attended training during the month of September. Uh, Sergeant Jackson and Officer Smith attended uh, an instructor training over at the county police academy uh, for a firearms and uh, vehicle simulator. Uh, Detective Sergeant Walker attended firearms background investigation training, and all officers attended uh, range qualifications. Uh, in terms of personnel, <coughs> excuse me, uh, officers Dixon and McCouch, they continue their recruit training at the police academy. Uh, all of our SLEOs, but for two, uh, finished working with us uh, at the end of September. Uh, and of those two, that we were thankful that you guys extended till the end of the year. Uh, of those two, one of them has since obtained a full-time position with state corrections. So I'll hopefully meet with uh, Mrs. Goucher to submit some requisition, requisition paperwork for, we did have one other SLEO that was available for the winter. Hopefully we can bring him in until the end of the year to supplement the so they're receiving. Um, and we ten tentatively have all but one uh, of our SLEO positions filled for 2018. Anything can happen at this point, but as of right now, all but one. Uh, in terms of the building, uh, for the past several weeks, we've been shifting offices around and conducting preliminary uh, type modifications to the first floor of the, the processing area uh, in hopeful construction to begin uh, shortly. And in that respect, I'd like to thank Rocky and DPW uh, for the job that they've done uh, helping us. We basically met with Rocky on, say, a Monday, explained to him what we'd like to do in terms of shifting things around and running wires and so on and so forth. And Tuesday, the next day, he had people down there uh, banging things out. It was, uh, it was great. And we're basically pretty much ready to go almost with the first floor, but for some computers that we have to move around. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Rocky, Tim, Bob McClure, Curtis, and Mr. Mixter from Public Works for the quick work and all of that. Uh, and we'll be meeting with Mrs. Rich and Mrs. Gallagher uh, tomorrow. Uh, they thankfully expressed some interest in helping us with uh, the furnishings for the proposed building. Uh, we're not much of decorators on our end, so hopefully <laughs> they, they have some good input, which I'm sure they will, and we appreciate that. And that's it. I have one question. Your pink badge is for breast yes. cancer? Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, Appreciate thanks. that. I get this is a good time. I, the, the police O&E budget is $79,000 if anybody is interested in what the total was, but it's unchanged from last year. Um, and, and we received three bids for the new police building. Is that correct? Six. 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 The three are under consideration. I guess you could say it that way. They're being evaluated now by the engineers for merit. Um, all of them. Technically, all of the bids will be are evaluated. Okay. Uh, and we're still looking to award when? Uh, you can't award until after the bond ordinance is adopted, so it should be the first meeting in December. You'll be eligible to award. 20 days after that. Right. Okay. All right. right. Okay. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Hmm. Captain Basaka. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, the operation in, at the Beach Patrol is obviously closed for the season. The building has been secured, and the lifeguard stands and the boats and everything are all. Uh, <coughs> batten down for the winter, and I'll be providing Public Works with a, a basic list of maintenance and repairs for next summer. 
Um, the operating budget is, I'm, I'm requesting 63,000. It was 63,000 last year. Uh, I just will be moving some of the line items around to tailor it more to what we need this coming year. And that's all I have. Was this year successful as far as yes. the beach patrol operations go? In retrospect, yes. They never and feel that <laughs> way when you're in the middle of it all, but yes, and the everyone was safe and okay. success. So you're sleeping better at night now, right? Yes. <laughs> the, the, new, the new structure of the bonus program met your expectations? It did work. It did, it about, did? I would say, exactly what, what uh, we had hoped. There were, um, we tracked it by the day starting in the middle of August, and there were eight, nine, ten, four, five more people working each day right to the very end. So it wasn't a drastic change, but it's significant. It allowed it us to keep uh, two or three more stands open every day. So I think it did work. Okay, so you'd be looking to do the same thing this coming season? Yes. And and the beach tag sales by the taggers? That How'd that the, work out? The sale, as far as the information I have over, I don't have this, the information for the preseason sales or anything like that, but the numbers that I uh, was wor that I, what I was working with were uh, the sales were up with the beach taggers on the beach. That's the only thing that really would. Yeah, that's real. That's really what I'm asking, Sandy. The, right. the tagger, the tagger sales, they were increased as opposed to last year. It was around 8,800 more than last year on the beach. Okay. And the bonus only was about 300 more total. So, and they did seem more motivated. I think it was a, a more direct approach, and it was uh, fairer to all the employees. So I think that was a success too. Again, it was not monumental, but it was it was a significant amount. Good. The, you had mentioned um, a while back about the uh, maybe looking to change the lifeguard stands from the wooden ones to. Do you want me to go over the capital, or is that no? I mean, I can, no, I know. I, I just want to know if that's still in the in the in oh, the, okay. uh, the planning. The stands we have, they're wood. They're they've been wood forever, mm -hmm. and they uh, as as they get older, they they uh, become waterlogged, right. and they become heavy. They only last three or four years, and they constantly need to be repaired. So you're, all, all I'm asking is, you're, 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 that's still in the planning stage, right? That's in the, in the yes. process. Yes, I, I okay. did get an estimate. I met with the, okay. the people that build them, and um, I guess in November we'll. Okay. Discuss good. That. Good. Sounds good. Right. What would they be made of if they're not made of wood? Aluminum. They're aluminum. Aluminum, right? Aluminum. There was one on what ninety fourth Street. Yes. All mm -hmm. summer. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, the, it's it's a shame to see the traditional ones go just because aesthetically yeah. they're so traditional. But I mean, I can certainly understand the transition. I just like the old ones Me to too. look at. Me too. Oh, maybe how, you can have one in your front yard. Something. No, that's okay. <laughs> I don't need one in the front yard. Lightning, Le lightning, or anything that's not conducive to. I don't know. Aluminum. Well, we we get the guards off of them regardless of the, either way, we would get the guards off of the stands if there's lightning, that, so it wouldn't really be, they won't be up there. Um, I'm not, I think we need to just weigh the, the cost is significant. They'll probably last 15 or 20 years, but they probably cost three times as much as the wooden ones, so, but the wooden ones only last three or four years. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, you know, and they're a lot lighter, right? So it's easier. They're lighter. Yeah. They won't Less need to be repaired every, and painted every spring, but um, they're expensive. So I'm okay with either, but all the wooden stands that we have would need to be replaced for next year because they're all in really bad shape. So we need new stands either way. I'd be happy with either. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll include the information with the, cap with the capital budget so right. you can see the the differences. Okay, thank I you. Would, I would say the aluminum ones are about three times as much. Wow. But they last about five times right. as long. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, see, this gives us an extra two months to wrap our head around. <laughs> yeah. Because we don't move real quickly here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and they have wheels on them. I wouldn't get them with the wheels. Okay, because the one I saw all summer had the wheels on it. Yeah, yeah that was a little. Yeah, I can't, okay. No it's like, what is up with that? We'd be fine with either, but 
the ones that we have would need to be replaced. And then the wooden ones are lighter when they're new. So. Okay. Interesting. Thanks, Sandy. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sandy. Our OEM coordinator now, who has some, something to talk about, so saves him for last. Good afternoon. Um, so at the request of council, uh, I went back to the drawing board, for lack of a better term, and I, I spoke with um, Public Works, the head of Public Works uh, grant, and I think we have come to what we would like to present to council is, I think, the best alternative, the best idea. Um, some suggestions involved Atlantic City Electric. Those were quickly shot down when I spoke to Ronnie Town. Um, I think the overall cost of the gates and the fact that once this problem is hopefully mitigated through the pumps would kind of leave us with this set of gates. So after speaking with Grant, um, we came up with, uh, with this. And basically, we did get a copy. He said, Jill, and I can get this to you. These are the same types of signage that we currently use for our road flooded now and the um, yield to pedestrian and crosswalks. These signs can actually be affixed to quick connects which will be placed in the roadway which are not visible. Generally speaking, they're, they're not visible when the signs aren't in place. They'll allow public works or the police, whomever we deem appropriate, to quickly deploy them. The cost is around $2,000 less than what the gates would be. Um, so we would save some money there. And then quite frankly, once hopefully we mitigate this problem with the pumps, we'll be able to repurpose these signs elsewhere. Um, so I think that this is the, the best idea. I believe that Grant is in agreement um, to move forward. I don't, we spoke about it yesterday and I think that this would probably be our best bet. Um, there's, somebody does hit one of them, it's not gonna cause any more damage than any of the signs that we currently have right now. So it, it solves the, some opinion, you know, opinion is that the, the, the railroad type gate systems can be unsightly and, and quite frankly, I, I tend to agree with that. I think this way, again, we can quickly deploy these, we can put them out, they are lightweight, but they are rugged, they're durable, they're designed to be hit by a car. Um, and there's five on each side, right? I believe we when would have to- When it's completely shut down, there's five on each. Yes, we would, I believe five would be enough. I don't think we're gonna need any more than that. Um, and then again, if we do ever, hopefully when we solve this, mitigate this problem, we'll be able to reuse them somewhere else. And you know, it'll be something that we have. And the signage will say road, road closed, right? So there's no, there's no misunderstanding as to. Yes. Okay. Yes. And we will have to have some other signage deployed because when we do do this, we are gonna have to put up detour signs, um, notifying people of a detour because we are closing a roadway. Uh, and Grant and I have already discussed that, and you know that'll just be another a responsibility. But you know we'll f we'll figure that out. Um, but this, I believe, is our best option. So the detours just would be right up to Second Avenue. It, One exactly, two. you're gonna exactly. That's it. No, well, it'll be no left turn, and you would have to put a detour okay. sign on Third Avenue. Probably, I I'm not sure the exact traffic laws. I don't know if it's two blocks or one block beforehand saying road close ahead, you know, the detour would be obviously to the east because we don't want anybody driving. Because I kept thinking no left turn when you immediately come off the bridge when I saw that, but you're saying the no left turn is gonna be indicating Third Avenue yes. is what that is. It's gonna for. have to it's gonna okay. have to be up there because again, we don't want people to start to make that turn and go, oh no, because we do have that problem now. <laughs> oh no, there's these gates. Um, you know, those are the types of things that public works will have to get, you know, worked out. I again I'm not I'm and then there sure has the to be one on the north side as well. Traffic laws. Right, then there's gotta be one on the other side. Yes. As well. Yes. You're talking about the detour signs, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, Are they it would just detour the traffic to the east because obviously if the roads flood the 9500 block of Third Avenue, we're not gonna send them down to the bay. Now are these gonna be the same kind of signs where it's that easy to just stick them in that there? Was, and that was gonna be my question. You'll have the same kind of flush I would, there. Boom. I would assume that that would probably be our best bet, yes. So there'd be nothing protruding from the road itself so that no. a car wouldn't. No, we that. actually have these signs currently being used um, around the borough. So well, again, I've seen them, but they're knocked over. There's well, they do get hit. They That's get them hit. getting, they're designed to actually do that. They're designed to break away. And then they're just they're laying there, yeah. yeah. And aesthetically, you're correct. Th those gates were absolutely obtrusive. I, I can appreciate that, I, and again, and that's why we went back to the drawing yeah, board. Yeah, they were and, terrible. And I think that this is 
this is, in my opinion, and I, I'm not going to speak for Grant, but we did speak yesterday about it. I, I believe that this is the best option for the borough if the borough does choose to do something. I think it would work. Sounds like it will work, definitely. Okay. So how, what's the next step in moving forward with this? What do we have to do now? Yeah. We'll order have em. to get an S. <laughs> order them? <laughs> yep. Get Grant, get on that. Get on that. <laughs> order them. I think you know, the, the, you're talking the cost the is money. roughly like $3,500, correct? Yeah, we'll find the money and order them. Done. <laughs> Consider it done. Do it quick. That's, that was his question, I know. I'm not sure why Rocky's laughing right now. <laughs> And because uh, then once you order and all the installations done by Public Works, correct? Okay. So I would say the next step is, you know, you, you so yeah, the, so they have and to go ahead. Order. They can proceed. With right. I would say if to, everybody's okay. in agreement, right? Does anybody not support the idea? No. Sounds good. Sounds Chief Shada, you're you're good with this uh, solution. That's the spirit. <laughs> and it's a total of five signs spanning that. I think that's definitely adequate notice. It'd be quite obvious that the road is closed. Is it five on each end? Five and five, ten? Yes. Right, correct. Yep, yeah. it's You're ten. Gonna, you'll have one in the center one and the then center two and then each lanes. Essentially one in each lane and then one on the shul each shoulder. Perfect. Are they easily seen at night? Are they uh, reflective? You, they're they're so reflective they can be blinding. Oh, nice. I mean, I don't know if any of you have <laughs> driven late at night and you come across the pedestrian signs. They reflect. They're so reflective that they cannot be missed. Okay. You can't miss As them. long as you've got your headlights on. And if you don't have your headlights on at night, then that's a problem for the chief. <laughs> Just <police>. saying. <laughs> so, um, so. Just saying. So the, I believe that that is going to be the final um, come to agreement on that. Uh, real quickly, again, there's no changes in the budget, no line item changes. But like anything else, if we need to move money around from here to there, we will do so. Hurricane season is wrapping up. We still have two more weeks. November 1st is the official end. So. It, looks like we are going we don't have anything in the works right now system so hopefully we have escaped another 2017 although sandy came at the very very end wow i know she said that <gasps> yeah, she um <laughs> yes <laughs> Great. Right you can name it hurricane jonathan if you need <laughs> other than that i have nothing else so Maggie, what are you mouthing? You're saying, or will they float away? No, they because can't, they can't float away. They're actually, essentially bolted to the street, so they can't float away. The only thing that can make, and even the high winds are not going to knock them down. If they get hit by a car, they are going to come down. They're designed to do that just simply so they don't damage the vehicles. Um, so they will be stored somewhere close by, roughly like you had said, possibly in the water tower. So now the water starts to come up. The police, if public works, if it's after hours, police can get them, boom, put them in, done. Done. I don't know if they can be stored in the water tower. That would have to be. Well, I don't know That's either. I'm just, we're just saying somewhere That's close. under Homeland Security. The water tower is? Come. Yeah. You mean the tower, not the building. So oh, you mean? The tower. Oh, okay. Yeah. Underneath the tower. Right. I thought you meant Inside the, the door there. And the water I, I'm still a little confused where you said it's going to be bolted to the ground. They're actually affixed by breakaway bolts to the mount is is basically mounted into the asphalt. Yeah, it's actually so it's and the, the system is bolted for lack of a better term. The gates are affixed in there with but it's with a recessed quick that yes oh, okay well, yes Joan there's one at, at our street at 103rd. Yep. I know I see it but it keeps. Uh, 104th and 3rd. It's getting knocked over. People keep running into it. Well, they it. make a too fast turn there. But it's <coughs> recessed in the ground, so yes, that a snow plow can go hit. over it. After the sign comes down, you won't hit that. No. Okay, fine. No. They are recessed into the pavement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Recess was the word missing. I, I apologize. <laughs> no, no apologies. Tough crowd today. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good job. That concludes else? the public safety portion of this presentation. Anybody have anything for public safety before we move on <coughs> to recreation and tourism?
afternoon, everyone. She's always double booked. Hello. Double booked. We do have a lot of stuff going on. So I'll start with the recreation budget. So you take a flip to it. Uh, so in 2016, we had, or I'm sorry, in 2017, the budget was $48,510, and I am recommending um, $48,710. The increase largely just stems from um, reallocating the uh, senior citizen activity reimbursement line item into the rec budget so I can keep an eye and just follow up on the reimbursement procedures. That used to be in mayor and council's budget, so it's just shifted. Has shifted. And then as far as tourism goes, um, in 2017, it was 128,000, and I recommend to keep that flat at 128,000. Any questions on budgets? Okay, so the two other items that I just wanted to bring to the table early, as was recommended to the committee, it's better to start early than always feeling like I'm behind the eight ball. Um, so for this past year, we had contracts with private services. Um, as soon as I find it. It was organized, I swear. So the private services agreement that was um, with the like the fitness classes, so the yoga's instructors, the um, boot camp instructor. Um, who else was in there? Tennis, tennis pro. Tennis was a little bit different, just because we put that out to bid. So oh, that same. still has to be discussed within committee whether we keep it the same format of requesting a proposal and then we set either a dollar minimum, percentage minimum, or we before we just had an open bid with a minimum of 28% owed to the borough. And so the, the bids would come in accordingly. Um, here we go. So it was um, surf camp, boot camp, yoga, sandbar, Zumba, triathlon, fitness training, uh, B races, uh, sure shot, and then the UK elite soccer camps as well as the other camps. So with all of that, those financials, the borough made $48,236.51, um, with majority of them having a 78-22 split. So the, or I'm sorry, 78% 70, 78-22. So the committee is recommending that we make contracts across the board 70-30 split. So I wanted just to have some discussion to see if um, you had questions and thoughts on that because Miranda was that 48,000 net yes okay thank yeah. you we were seeing um, in many of those events that Miranda was listing large amounts of money coming in but we were just getting a small portion of it and in some instances we had some serious expenditures to be able to make those projects happen and I'm not sure if you have one uh, handy, Miranda, that you might be able to uh, point to where, for example, uh, pub our public works people that might have had to, uh, or, or a police department who might have had to uh, be present in order to make these happen. The races are naturally um, driven by public works and police. So I feel like they are a little bit of a separate animal, can, but can still kind of be discussed in the same breath. Um, I thought they paid them. They I, paid, yeah. I so thought the that they paid policy, that already. They probably, I mean, but it's still the split. So it's still 78, 22. So I thought- Plus covering departmental costs. Okay, I thought before they were paid, we deducted the cost of police and public works. No, so what no? happens, they give us a check for what incurred last year, and then we figure out if there's a um, discrepancy after services are rendered, then the departments give me what was right. used, what. So they they are, they're already being billed, though, for the police services and. Correct. The, okay. Yes. Okay, so that is something that's already being billed. Yes, but it's the percentage that we obtain 
either in advance or on race day, that's the 7822s. Okay, so there isn't any excess then. Just want to make sure. Not for that. Okay, one. not for no. them. They're it's already just paying that percentage. That. Okay. If you wanted to discuss okay. an increase in that percentage for that one, I, I, but you can go into um, surf camp with public works certainly, um, surf camp and yoga. I mean, how many? No, I, I just they do. What do you mean no. you can get for just them. the grooming of the beaches? I mean, naturally oh. done already, but they're just very cognizant of Miranda. yoga oh, okay. on the beach. Miranda, on your, on your form, I think what Manchur was referring to was um, you would you had showed us what the EUS revenue was, but then you also oh, that form. showed the capital improvement expenses that we've had to do and the wages we have to pay out for the supervisor mm, for the EUS. Correct. So the, That's what yeah, and just to simplify the justification for the 70-30 split um, with the revenues of being $48,236.51, um, the capital improvements uh, just for next year that we are proposing is upwards of $150,000. And then plus just the uh, supervisor that's in charge of um, physically collecting all of these monies and tracking it and handling their payroll, um, we are already down by $11,000. So we're looking just to recoup some of the losses that we're taking, not just in O&A and salary and wages, but in capital as well for all the improvements that we're making in the recreational um, facilities. So you're saying the 70-30 split that you're proposing would bring you up? Wouldn't bring us up very much, but it would only um, make a dent of $5,751 if we brought in the same revenues as we did in 2017. I just worry about the effect this is going to have on, on these events, and, and I thought about this more. You know, in, in many ways, so a lot of these events are part of the fabric of this community, and you know, we're take, it looks like we're going from 78 to 70. That's another 8% off of revenue off of whoever's doing this event. I get it. Um, in many ways, I think sometimes these events, the borough at some level has to just um, look at it almost <coughs> as a lost leader. And this, it's, these are, some of these things are what make Stone Harbor Stone Harbor. So I, I think we have to be really careful about just to, to make the numbers match, cutting another 8% off of it, because I think they'll, at some point, they obviously walk away, and then, you know, that, that's, that's, in my mind, a part of uh, the, the community, bringing people together for these events, and, and I think they make life here vibrant and fun, and I think we have to be careful. These are specifically focused just on yeah, the private services classes. for the fitness classes. These right. are fitness classes. So utilizing right. the yeah. borough yeah. facilities, yeah. basketball courts, tennis sure. courts, all that stuff, and just the upkeep and the general maintenance of it all. And they can, the ones that are using that can always raise their rate a dollar or two if they feel that it's necessary. We yeah. don't, yeah, we there don't were a few tell of them, them last year. We mm -hmm. don't tell them what we fee to charge. Dictate, no. You're talking about the independent contractor? Yeah, so they can, if it was $20, they can make it 22 or if, I mean, I have no idea what the prices are for those classes. Mm -hmm. They're charging like 15 to 17 a class, okay. and then they'll do some kind of a ticket that's like 100 classes for $120 or, mm -hmm. right. or something like that. I mean, it's exactly. the definition of small business. And but this is, yeah. this is a good thing for them because they don't have any overhead. They do not. They have nothing. We have right. the overhead. And the wear and tear. Yes, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And all of the administrative mm -hmm. costs. I'm they don't have We any. take, I'm no, because we're taking all the administrative oh, headaches off of them. Truthfully, I don't see anybody oh. walking away from a relationship like this because they have a command audience mm -hmm. that shows up and is willing to pay this money. And we do all the work for it for them to conduct their classes, so. And to be perfectly honest, in some instances, we have waiting lists. Mm -hmm. We have people who would love to be able to get in on it. And but they're not as good, though. You gotta make sure that you have a quality, mm -hmm. you have to have quality people conducting the classes as well, though. I mean, it's the same, that's why it's an EUS, because it's an extraordinary unspecifiable service. You don't just pick the lowest, you pick the best service you're gonna get. But these contractors would not repeatedly come back every single year if they weren't making some kind of profit. Right. Well, right. they are. If you look, though, yeah, the, the amount are. that the borough's yeah. been making so has if, if it has it has been increasing every year and because if it was we are a problem because for them, they're increasing. Um, um, if it was a problem for them, I'm sure they would come to you or they'd come to Miranda or Manchur or somebody and say, "Listen, I'm this not is making, the cost. This split. is cost not cost effective for me." 
<laughs> is there here? Uh, is anybody else? Well, Ray? I just I don't uh, Miranda. The capital improvements here you have at one hundred and fifty three thousand six eighty. And that's just what will be proposed for 2018. And that, so that doesn't account and what for does that, that, in, that includes what? Just the tennis support building. Yeah, but what capital improvements are we making to it? We have to build it. We're building it. Oh, we're building it. <laughs> oh, that's a big capital improvement, isn't it? <laughs> okay. That was part of an origi the original open space project that's now on year three, I believe. Right, it's on year three. Yes. That's the one with the grandstand over the tennis court. Yeah. Right, so it would be a small support building just as an office space, multi-user restrooms for men's and women, and then um, an observation deck on the top for tournaments and or just um, you know parents or spectators watching lessons. Well then, but after that's done, right? right. You're built, then that, that large ticket item goes away, and now mm -hmm. you're back down to a much more reasonable split. Oh, no, there's always going to be something to do. There's a, a, <laughs> a, a, yes. There's always <laughs> the improvements. The playgrounds, basketball courts, any recreational facility has a monster price ticket on it. And the absence And especially in a seashore town, there's improvements that we're going to have to make very soon on a playgrounds that just got installed just the wear and tear on the, um, the usage, but then the salt water is mm -hmm. killing it. Public Works has been fabulous and has been trying to solve a lot of those issues um, with the rusting that we're already getting on a you know, two-year-old playground. And you're planning to redo the skateboard park too, right? Right, and then that's still out there. Um, we uh, visited this week and mm -hmm. discussed um, options for the skateboard park and Every one of those had big dollar signs behind them. Mm -hmm. So it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. Ongoing. Recreation's yep. ongoing. Just like everything else. Mm -hmm. right. I just think it's a big, big increase at one shot. 8%. Is there any way to phase it? Or if there's any way even every year we're signing a contract, is there any way of having it a graduated increase and signing, say, a three-year contract with, so they can maybe lay out their own business plan. And, and I understand, um, I guess I see it the opposite. They're taking away a lot of our headaches mm -hmm. because we don't have to staff it. If somebody doesn't show up, we're not scrambling on the phone to find somebody. Um, if somebody gets hurt, it's not gonna be a workman's comp claim in Stone Harbor. And I kind of see it as you know, if, if we were to, for example, if we were to take this over ourselves, it would be huge and the insurance would be huge and so on and so forth. And I feel like as you look at these numbers, the borough is increasingly making more money because each of these businesses is getting more and more people. They're mm -hmm. building They're this building clientele that's continuing yeah. to come. Mm -hmm. And you can see the, the differences in 2016 from you know the boroughs getting another four thousand dollars from one vendor alone from the boot camp, and I'm just you know I I always just think this small business has a handful of weeks to make it. I hate to hit it a huge eight percent if there's or if we it could be graduated but they be guaranteed a couple of years, and maybe work it up to the eight something like that. Maybe do a four six eight. And then we start to figure in all that, and then by the same token, you're not every single year doing all these contracts, because that's time consuming. <laughs> so if we could somehow have a, be more of a long range plan that can balance out the capital, and then maybe it's not as tough a pill to swallow to a small business saying we're gonna take 8% more from you. If we say we're gonna take 4% this year, then six, then eight, and work it out that way. If we can, is there any reason why we couldn't have three-year contracts with, with an EUS? Is there any reason that, it, and they're just something to can, can we think about? Can we possibly just uh, send out, you normally send out letters saying what the fee split will be, et cetera? Right, so around this time I would send an agreement proposal so that we kind of send back their outline of what they would want to host next season. Um, with all of their insurance and all the necessary documents. And in that paperwork, I would then say what the percentage would be. So if they decide not to submit a proposal because they, they ran their numbers and they can't support themselves, 
then that's the time they would say. So or it would never would be brought to you. So the only things I'm going to bring to you are the ones that will sign a contract. So maybe we need to test the waters that possibly you won't even hear a, a word out of them. But still explore a contract, a three-year yeah. contract or something to make it. At that, yeah, I, I mean, but I do think we have to go to the 70-30. I think we were remiss for too many years not increasing at all. And I do think for the administrative costs and, and all the money that we have invested in it and the liabilities we still have with this, I think we need to go to the 70-30. But, yeah, keep it like that for a couple of years. Then everybody We're, knows what page they're on. Because I, well, I mean, just a difference of opinion. I don't see what we have invested in it other than if, if we were to do three-year contracts, our administrative costs would drop dramatically because th we wouldn't be putting this time into it. Well, and if we could work up. Well, I, I, yeah. Ashley was the supervisor this past year, and she had her hands full. I mean, there's if we now advertise for these programs, then we become the face of that program. So we're handling all the customer service complaints. They they don't understand the difference. They don't know. Right. Put a little asterisk in there saying that somebody else runs this. Right. Talk to them. Right. <laughs> so we're right. trying our best to facilitate right. questions, the refunds, all that good stuff. Everything they handle. It's not just the yeah. contracts. You handle. Yeah. Right. Everything. I just look at some of these small. I'm, other than than the one, they're they're small. They're small business people that are trying to make it in eight weeks, ten weeks. But they've got businesses elsewhere throughout the rest of the year. Right, just like everybody else who waits for the right. summer to make it. <laughs> so they try to hit it in the summer. I think, I think what we have to be <clears throat> concerned with is what we can do for Stone Harbor and what Stone Harbor needs. And I know I've seen the programs up there, and I know the administrative costs, and we do have a cost investment in the facilities themselves everywhere. This We have a bond out there to pay for Absolutely. the recreation building, to pay for the playgrounds, to pay for the tennis courts. We got open space money, but a portion of that was ours to bear too. I don't think anyone disputes that these costs on our, that we're bearing are, um, would normally be attributable to the person running the program or the event. That is how business is done. But what I think to, to refer to my earlier point is I think we have a responsibility to help um, these small businesses develop our brand. They're in essence developing our brand, the seashore at its best. People love these programs. If one or two of them were to go away, people would be upset. Renters would be upset, homeowners would be upset. Um, and if we keep continuing down this road and cutting into what they're able to make in that short window, I think you will have people turn away and say, you know what, I'll go, I'll go somewhere else. I'll go to another town where um, I, it's a little more business friendly. So uh, I think we have a responsibility and, you know, I, I just heard that we're only making up, this is really somewhat of a pittance compared to what our administrative costs. So what's it really, well, it's really hurting the business owner more than really helping us because it's so, such a small increase. So the impact on the small business owner is very heavy and the impact to the borough is somewhat insignificant. So I don't, I don't think, for it's $5,000, that's what we're talking about? Yeah, 57. It's, in my mind, it's... I, I think I, if I we were going 50-50, because we're providing everything for them, but we're not. We're talking 70-30. I don't see that we are hurting anyone. I mean, if, if you send out the contracts with this amount in, and you get a flood of phone calls saying, I can't do this, then we'd have to, you'd have to say, well, let me talk to the council and see what we can do. But I... Uh, I would believe that that would not happen. The bottom line is that the cost of doing business for the borough at the rec center goes up every year. Everything that we pay for to be able to have all of these employees, to be able to um, keep the program and the building running continues to grow. Absolutely. And I guess my point is this as well. So let's assume everyone bails on us. Then now we have to run the program. And like uh, mm -hmm. Mayor Judy said, what's that going to cost us? So I, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think I'm not saying gonna it gonna is going to happen. happen. I'm I saying that's the alternative. I don't and think it's going to happen. I think that they are all um, good business people. And I think if they look at it and study it and understand what we are giving and what we are doing, that um, this is not going to break the bank. 70-30 um, um, 
like we said, we have not moved that for a long, long, long time. I mean, I think it was moved a little bit last year, but it's been 70 or 80, 20, whenever, how many years. I, you know, I understand it. I think that, uh, I think it's a good deal for Anybody everyone. Else? For everyone. It's just a lot to contemplate um, because I understand where Charles is coming from as goodwill for businesses that they like to be here. We're providing a service for the children, for the adults, for the young adults. Maybe there's something that we have to absorb along the way. Where do I go from here? Because this is the time of the year that I would normally send out just a reminder for them to submit their proposals. Well, what's everybody's thoughts on having longer contracts? I, I like that idea. If <laughs> rather than just in, like every year that Miranda has to prepare all this paperwork yeah, and absolutely. all this notification take place. I have no problem with absolutely. That. If so we if did it was 70 30 for three years. Yeah, I could do that. Can we do a 70 30? six the first year and then go to eight the second and maintain the eight to third <laughs> i'm just thinking of the, i'm just thinking like i said of the small business and it's eight percent most things if you looked at something and said wow that's an eight percent increase that's the reason why i say that as opposed to a right incremental when we look at the gross hmm. net that we're talking about it's five thousand dollars and we divide it among all of the activities that miranda listed they're all sharing in that $5,000 deficit for themselves. It's not that much money. Again, there's two sides to that argument. It's even less for us, given our budget. It's way less for us, given what our Well, as we sit in budget meetings, yep. we realize that sometimes those are the kinds of numbers that we have to see coming in. My point is that that's a and I said it before, it's part of the fabric of this community. This isn't, we're not, we're not always just running numbers here. This is what people want to see. And if it puts a chilling effect on it going forward, I'm against it. And I feel like 8% is a big chunk. These and people I aren't prepared for 8%. No one plans a business for having uh, an increase in 8% one year over another. And I think I initially when uh, the contractor looks at it or whomever it is, We'll say that, wow, that's an 8% increase. It kind of says, how am I going to make that up? Will they? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at what your costs go up every year. And I say, how much <coughs> goes up 8%? Your health care goes up 8%. Everything we yeah. do goes up by that yeah. much money. I don't think, in the whole scheme of things, with the package that they get here, they aren't going to get anywhere else. With the type of clientele, that they have here, I don't think they're going to be so fast to run out the door. Well, wouldn't it, maybe I'm wrong again, but wouldn't they just pass this cost on to their customers? Who sets the rates for these yeah, things, they right? They do. They set their own. We don't tell them what That's they're what right. they do. And, right. and the people and will pay it to and if, these uh, classes. You know, I, I, I agree with Charles on the statement that, uh, well, a couple of his statements, and the $5,000 is it's minuscule to us. It almost doesn't mean anything uh, in the big scheme of things. So we have to look at what the impact's going to be. On the other hand, if Miranda sends out uh, 70, 30 letters, and then we'll know what, we'll, we'll know what the impact's going to be pretty quick. Yes. Whether people are going to pull out or start to pull out. We may have to come back and readdress this. I don't know. Like, I, I think Karen said that if, if, if somebody's saying they're not going to do it and yet we want to have this pick one Zumba class or something, then maybe Miranda's got to come back to us and say, you know, we're going to lose this if we don't negotiate with these people. By the same token, we sat at a public you know. safety meeting with a $200,000 difference as if we could build that uh, new police station. Mm -hmm. And we were beginning to cross out um, align items. Right. Were we going to use LED bulbs or were we right. going to use this kind of bulb so that we could save $240? But then we came to our senses pretty but quick, we did. didn't we? Yeah. And we did. And we just went for the 200000 That 200000 has got to be made up somewhere. So then maybe if we do lock it in at 70 30 for a couple of years, then there's no fear that this is just going to continue to rise. That, I'd like to make that a motion. 
to do three to do a seven year contract with a three year contract. I'll second that. So then people won't be as they They'll won't feel be like, more wow, secure. what is next? Right. You know, next year another five yeah. percent. Well, most, in, most importantly, I want to hear what Miranda has to say after you've heard all of this. Mm -hmm. I know. Well, before Miranda says anything, right. I just want it to be known that uh, in committee, this was the number was just not pulled out of the sky. We discussed it at great length with Miranda, with Jill, with committee members, with everything, with all of the players in front of us deciding what would be the best thing, not only for the borough, but also for the community Spending. at large. So, Miranda? You go. No, I think Charles was just saying after the fact, once I send these proposals out, what feedback do I get from these contractors? I will bring back in November or okay. sooner if you prefer you email. On the motion. So that's what I was going to say. Are we, is it something we're going to act on now that we're saying we would, everybody's in agreement, 70-30, offer three-year contracts? Are you allowed to that do that? That was what the workshop? motion was. That's what that the solicitor motion. said, yes. And it can be done during workshop? So what I would ask motion. Miranda is that before you send out the formal letter, let me look at it. Yes. Because I think we may <laughs> have to couch it as one year with a two-year option mm -hmm. for a total okay. of three. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the motion is for to approve three-year contracts, 70-30 split. Um, solicitor is going to review the actual specifics before it goes out, be a one year with two year options. And then isn't there always like a 30 or 60 day clause to pull out on any contract? I'm sorry. If either, isn't there, isn't it standard in any of these EUS is a, is a 90 day clause to pull out or, or, or no, am I wrong? There would be an option period in which they have to elect in writing to exercise the option. But it would be- And would either party. The opportunity to do it. Okay. Okay. I think, so what I initially send out is just the request for proposal, but it's it's not as formal as the ones that um, we've done for the tennis pro. So I will communicate with you, Mark, and see right. how we don't, we specific don't need it needs to be. Do that checklist that we do right. for the tennis pro, right. but we should articulate how it's gonna be structured. And I think we can right. get to the three year, but it may have to be one year with a two year bump. Okay. Just wanna look to make sure we're not in any bid violations. Okay, okay, thank you everyone. So we have to vote though. Yeah, Are we all in favor or do we call the roll? It's motion, but we just say aye. What do we do? We can say aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We got a second from Karen. Did somebody just ask yeah. me if we got a second? I did. Josie and I second. Yeah, because I thought I just heard it. We did a float in the <laughs> yeah. air. Did you get a second? I thought I heard yeah, that floating in the air. It floated. Okay. Um, it floated your way. Okay. Six no, eyes. not opposed. Six eyes. And then the next item, and I'll get out of your hair, <laughs> again, starting early on the 2018 recreational fees, only because um, it's fresh in our brain after summertime just happened. So again, just discussion um, for 2018 proposed recreational fees. I do not want to change any of them aside from, I would like to recommend adding an unlimited open play pass to the pickleball um, option. There was not a membership per se this year because it is very different from the sport of tennis. But um, just to refresh your memories, pickleball plays for uh, four days a week in the mornings for an open play when a group of people will play together and then they rotate in. So what we charged this past year, which is, seems to be across the board on all these new facilities popping up, is a $2 per player for the two hours of the play. So the two different levels would play for the two hours off court and the next level comes on for another two hours of play. We had a lot of repeat offenders, but I think a lot of people were um, turned off, I guess would be the best way to say that we didn't have an option of here's a one card, one time fee. You just sign in every day that you're a card holder and I would handle all the administrative aspects of that. But a $75 unlimited open play pass is what I would like to add for next year. Um, and then the next was to increase the youth sports clinics to, I couldn't tell you how many years, it's been $35 per clinic. Um, the season so it's seven weeks 
two times a week, so 14 total sessions for one hour a day. They will receive um, training in all various sports. Um, for two years now, it has become a trend where um, parents will sign their children up for these respective activities, and because it is only $35, um, they do not have the courtesy to show up. So we have them as a placeholder, taking away spots for other children that could potentially be um, participating. So unfortunately, May 1 is when um, property owners can register, and sometimes for four years now, I've had it online where they can register, but the word's still getting out there that they can do it from their residence if they're not a full-time resident of Stone Harbor to where they miss that window of opportunity, and then the floodgates open to all non-residents, and they take up all of those, the rest of the remaining spots for the remaining sports clinics. So the increase is um, preferred and recommended to make the parents a little more accountable to attending these sports clinics and also to cover our expenses. Um, so the 2017 revenues that we brought in for just sports clinics alone was $14,916. Salary and wages was $24,000 just specifically to cover these clinics. And the OE expenditures and just equipment purchases to cover these clinics was $10,000. So we, um, we were in the red for $19,871. So if we do increase the fee to the $75, we will be ahead of the game next year. And is it clinic every day, Monday through Friday? Monday through Thursday, twice a week. So either Monday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday. Didn't we just do something similar to that for a basketball program? Yes, we increased to 50. And we did that only to make to incentivize people to come. Yes. If they invest that Same much. Same thing. And they, did it improve yes, the It attendance? did improve. And we also added another caveat that they had to play at least seven of the 14 games in order to play in playoffs. Hi, so I'm they're signing alive. up and not showing. Yes. And then they would play in playoff game. If they were a stud, they were a game changer and they would win. So that is very unsettling to some parents when their kid is out there. I have a question, yeah. a couple questions about pickleball. Yeah. Um, first of all, how was the attendance on the pickleball? It was wonderful attendance on the pickleball. So it was over 2,200 people that at, played in the course of the two dollars a person. Mm -hmm. Because you do know Avalon doesn't charge anything for pickleball. Yeah, for inside. Yes, yeah. they right. charge nothing. Right. So do you think with the seventy-five dollar packet that we might lose people and say? In other words, That's are you going to have the option, That's or is it just going to be a seventy-five dollar? No, they have the option. They can still do the they two dollars for the play. The two dollars. Mm -hmm. okay. But for the ones that know they're going to be in town yeah. most of those ten weeks, mm -hmm. they have that option. Okay, but and they could do either or. Either and then or. They request it. They did. Mm -hmm. They did. Yeah. Um, and administratively, that would help. Big time. So that's just to plant the seed. So is there, are there any questions on that or would I be able to bring that forward in November? Since I'm so interested in pickleball, are the courts that crowded that if they chose that $75 packet that they wouldn't be able to get on? Like they can come and sign up for a $2 one and see like, okay, well it's too busy for the next one or the next one. So they're not gonna, they're not, they're gonna pay their $2 and leave. But if you paid the $75 and then you come and you still can't play. It's, it's that's busy. the chance that they have to take. It's, they rotate in anyway, so they know that they might be sitting for 15, 20 minutes. If there were potentially 50 people out there at the same time and you can only play 24 at a time. So that is all I have. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. I, I know that you've sent out the uh, survey about the mayor's yes. wellness program. Yeah. Are they coming back and how I have look? 38 and I was waiting for a little bit more um, just to get a better report for you, but a lot of great feedback and in just my quick glances, um, 37 of the 38 would prefer a campaign and it was a close, um, it was like 50-50. There was, I gave the alternative of January, February versus March or April when they would want to participate and January and February won. And most of them said like eight to 10 week session, they do like that format. Um, and I just have to go through the rest of the data because I asked a lot of questions. 
So I gotta go through that, but they gave a lot of good feedback. If we do like the lectures, I think is a number one that we do have to have. So what topics would they wanna hear on? So it's just a lot of digestion that I have to do, which I will then put together in a nice neat email for you. So you can- We have $1,000. We have a thousand dollars. Well, I was hoping too that maybe something at the league was interesting. Yeah. You know what I mean? The right. Mayor's Wellness Campaign is going to be represented at right. the league, so maybe there'll be something interesting up there, just an idea or something that right. you know. Yeah, because they do. Do they do like a lecture? Do they? Have they're like at a couple of different things. Yes, and then they of course they're they going to have a booth, and then there is a couple of things going on with it. So. Okay. I thought while I was up there, I kind of see if there's anything interesting that's maybe yeah, we can happening. steal an idea we can steal from somebody or it generates another idea or something like that. I mean, I'm biased, but everybody I look at, all the other towns. <laughs> Ours is always better anyway. Ours is always better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see yeah, if there's, there's anything interesting up there. Yeah. All right, good. All right, I'm done. Thank you. Can I ask one Thanks. last question? The harvest, the, the uh, the Harvest Festival event that the package that I have uh, still it lists the uh, liability insurance as pending. Is that it's have gone. it in my hands, okay. so I emailed that to okay. Sue this Thank afternoon. You. I got it soon. Yeah. <laughs> and then they confirmed what they are actually doing on the nodes. So Steve, the animal guy, SH Rocks hashtag SH Rocks painting station, pumpkin decorating station, and then face painting and busy bees honey stand will be the activities on the four nodes. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything for Miranda? Before she leaves Thank us? You, Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, everyone. 431. We're getting pretty good. <laughs> anything else before we adjourn? All right. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We're adjourned.